Hi, how's everybody doing? I'm gonna start out with a question. Um, this is a tough one. Who uh, had a hit song when the first automated uh, radiology paper was published? Was it Elvis in the 50s, Billy Joel in the 70s, Vanilla Ice in the 90s, or Taylor Swift in the 2000s? Now, uh, bonus points if you know that Vanilla Ice's real name is Matt Van Winkle. Um, the answer here is Elvis. Uh, in 1955, the first pub, uh, paper was published on using computers to make diagnoses in uh, radiology, and that's Dr. Lodwick. He was a radiologist and a computer scientist, and uh, he was the first, again, to describe this. He actually received a Nobel Prize nomination for this work, but uh, you've never heard of him. And this is one of the reasons why. This is a five megabyte hard drive in 1955. <laughs> It's hard to believe, I, it's just hard to believe. Um, and so clearly the technical uh, things that he needed to do, what he knew was possible, just they weren't available. Uh, but times have changed, we now have GPUs, we have powerful neural networks, you all know the drill. Um, and now computer scientists are amazing. They can do things like tell the difference between parrots and guacamole and blueberry muffins and chihuahuas. It's incredible what they can do. Um, but those of us in imaging, we sort of ask ourselves, why can't we do this for medical imaging? And uh, can we do something that's a little bit more meaningful and impactful? There's a lot of reasons why we want to do this. Uh, there's a lot of errors in medical imaging, and clearly that's a problem. It causes patient harm, and deep learning can address that. Um, and also, two-thirds of the world's population, we keep losing sight of this, two-thirds of the world's population does not have access to medical imaging. That's over four billion people. Um, we can use deep learning to potentially address this, and that's, that's what we try to focus on. So uh, medical imaging isn't easy. Um, it's a little bit harder than cat uh, pictures. Uh, most of the pixels in that image will tell you there's a cat there. Um, but most of the pixels in the, other, in the other image actually tell you this person's healthy. And it's only that little area but indicated by the arrow that tells you that person actually has a deadly lung cancer. Making a mistake here is kind of a problem, right? So we need to get it right. Um, but the question is still valid. Can we use these tools to make diagnoses? And if so, will they ever be as good as human experts? So that's really the question that kicked off what was my first collaboration with a computer scientist uh, about a year and a half ago, and that's with Andrew Eng uh, and Pranav Raj Prakar, who's his PhD student. And we looked at uh, 400 x-rays, we gave them to 12 radiologists and said, here you go, uh, make all your diagnoses, and then we also had a computer model. And we compared the performance between the two groups. And what we found was that the computer model did just as well as our human experts, 12 of them from around the country, which was incredible. Um, and what's more is it only took the model 60 seconds to go through 400 x-rays, whereas it took our human experts almost four hours. So we knew we kind of had something on our hands, something pretty exciting, so we've uh, spread out. We do things in, uh, in next CTs uh, for the emergency department. We're looking at neonatal brain MRIs for congenital abnormalities. We're even finding uh, cancer cells on pathology slides. And thanks to all of the projects that are going on around Stanford and collaborations with others, we've sort of formed a home base known as AMI, the Artificial Intelligence and Medicine and Imaging Center. This is led by Kurt Langlotz, and this is actually an old slide. We have 80 faculty now across nine departments and three schools, and it's just continuing to expand. It's hard to keep up. Uh, we actually just finished the first in the world multi-center uh, multi prospective clinical trial for these tools uh, in the clinic, and that's actually led by Packard Children's Hospital uh, by Dr. Halabi. But the interesting thing that we keep uh, finding is that uh, a lot of radiologists and pathologists clearly want to use these tools and we get it, um, but we're getting a lot of interest from clinicians, clinicians that don't normally interpret images. And um, here's what they tell us. So they have a patient, um, they're you know, working them up for maybe pneumonia, and then they're waiting. They're waiting for a result from the radiologist because the radiologist is busy, right? They have a lot of things to do, they have a lot of things to prioritize, and they get overwhelmed. There's a lot of deep learning companies and projects that are focusing on making that radiologist more efficient, and that's great. But we've been wondering, could we potentially make the clinician more efficient? And could we give them the power of these AI tools to make diagnoses on their own in the clinic? And so that's the question we've been asking scientifically. Um, we take uh, primary care docs, surgeons, even nurse practitioners, and we randomize them into two groups. One gets AI assistance, one does not. We have them go through imaging studies, we do a washout period. This is kind of a classic con uh, crossover control trial setup. And then, uh, and then we switch the groups. So this way, they kind of provide their own internal control. And we started with orthopedic surgeons. Um, they tend to like to read their own imaging anyway, so we figured, why not? Um, they, uh, they, uh, they're very good at neomerize, um, and so we figured that would be a nice place to start. We, we, gave, uh, we gave them 120 neomerize, and we had a deep learning model trained on 1500, which, by the way, we have released publicly, and that you can use to build your own neomerize um, uh, uh, classifier. Um, and we published this last year as well. 
another project led by Andrew Eng's team. And what we found was that the clinicians were pretty good at baseline. If you compare that to, uh, to human expert performance, they do pretty well. But when they get the AI assistance, they do even better. And they do even better across these categories. In fact, in ACL tear, they reached the level of a subspecialist expert radiologist performance, which was exciting because this could mean potentially less false positives, uh, less people shopping around for healthcare because they're not getting the answer they need. So we do a lot of these other projects, but I just wanted to highlight this one in particular for the purposes of my broader uh, talk here. And this is a really exciting project. We had a contact from pulmonologists and infectious disease doctors from the University of Cape Town. They have a clinic where they treat HIV positive patients and they work them up for possibly having active TB. Um, clearly not something we deal with in Silicon Valley, so we don't have the expertise here to help them. So they gave us lots of data and we said we'd work together to try to create a tool that would make them better at making those diagnoses. So this is called ChexAid, pardon the name, it's just the best we could do. Uh, but we developed a tool now that can take some of the clinical data about these patients and the pixel data and help the clinician at the point of care make a decision. Do, do I think this person has active TB or not? And we base this, or the model was trained on using ground truth of sputum cultures, which is the gold standard. So if you look at their baseline accuracy, it's okay. You know, it's modest. Um, this is where the experts are. So this is clearly a very difficult task. This is about as good as it gets. Um, and with our AI tool, they actually exceeded the experts in their own center, uh, which was a pretty surprising result. This paper is currently under peer review now. We're excited to sort of release this. But um, just to give you a sense of how hard this is, I tried it. And this is where I fell, unfortunately. It's, it's a coin flip. It's really a difficult task. We don't see a lot of these patients here. Um, and so this is a great opportunity for these, uh, for these clinicians. One thing you may have noticed was that in the one side, um, this is a modern uh, healthcare system with advanced imaging. And on the other side, we have this sort of plain film, uh, maybe heterogeneous uh, infrastructure. This vast difference is really going to create a problem for deployment, right? How are we going to give uh, these AI tools to assist these clinicians in these completely disparate situations? Um, you might know where I'm going with this. We're going to use the smartphone, right? Okay, so this is, the, this is the thing that's in everyone's hands right now. Some of you may be looking at your smartphone. It's okay. I do it too. Um, but we know that more people have access to smartphones than they do to clean water. And so if we can leverage this to deploy some of these tools, we can potentially get closer to that thing I talked about earlier about addressing some of those disparities. So we developed an app. This is actually not me. Um, this is actually done by Amir Kiani and the Andrew Ng Lab, um, where you can take a picture of either a screen uh, or a film uh, and potentially receive a diagnosis to help you make a decision about your patient. One thing you might know about smartphone cameras is that they don't always faithfully reproduce what they're taking a picture of. So on the left, there's some artifact there, right? That's called Moray artifact when you take a picture of a screen. And on the right, that's a glare. That's from taking a picture of a film. Um, and this is what happens when you use smartphone photos to, uh, to, to work with your model. Your performance goes down. And this performance is too low for us to really use in the clinic. And so we've been working now uh, on a project that's wrapping up uh, using uh, different techniques to improve the performance of the model, uh, such as synthetic perturbations, um, specifically focusing on Moray artifact and glare artifact uh, to address some of these shortcomings. This project is wrapping up this quarter. I'm, I'm working on, I'm at a university. I've got to work on the quarter cycle. Um, so this will be coming up very soon, but we're very excited to see that our trend line is going back up. We're getting to the place where we can use these tools on a smartphone, and we're very excited to try this out in a clinical trial. And that might look like this. You go and see your doctor, you have a cough, the doctor takes an x-ray, is able to take a picture of that, confirm their suspicion of maybe you have pneumonia, and is able to treat you and send you home. Now, if you're at an urgent care clinic and you're a nurse practitioner, this could really uh, enhance care, right? It could potentially provide some big advantages. But if you're in a different part of the world where you're using film or you don't have the same efficiencies, this smartphone platform would still work. Um, and the idea here is that it's scalable, and we get to a place where we can, again, do some of the things that we, we set out to do at the beginning. So this is the tagline, radiologic expertise in a smartphone. Clearly has all the packages here. Uh, but I do want to thank the team. This is really just a small snapshot of the people involved in these projects I've just talked about. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be a part of it, and, uh, and we're looking forward to continuing our work. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you.